Hello and welcome everyone. We're really excited to have you all here today for our weekly deep dive series with OCI Product Management. Uh, for those of you who may be new to our events, we're hosted on Cloud Customer Connect, which is our Oracle community forum for end users. You'll see links in the chat throughout the presentation today that lead you back to the Cloud Customer Connect forums. And if you don't already join us there, we invite you to create a free account, join in discussions, look for upcoming events on all kinds of topics. I am Kenna Ketrick. I'm a program manager with the OCI go-to-market team. And today I'm joined by a whole host of folks here. Uh, Matt Leonard, VP of Product Management Compute, as well as Jeff Browning, Sanjay Palai, and Manish Kapoor from Product Management here at OCI. And we're also joined by Matt Taylor and Sean Barley from Ampere Computing. Today, they'll all provide some deep technical insight into ARM, delve into some tools and platform options for developers, including a demo, and have plenty of time for Q&A throughout. Before we get into that, I do have one quick poll that I'd like to run, our usual beginning poll for those of us who've joined you uh, joined before here. Uh, each week, we put you in touch with product managers and developers behind recently launched services, and we want to design this series with you, our end users, in mind. So if you want to take a moment, answer that poll, let us know what topics interest you the most. We'll use that for our future planning. Speaking of which, uh, we do have one next week on Thursday, June 17th. We're hosting Sri Rambrinda and Tim Mooney on database management, including some demos of common use cases, extensibility, and how to use our comprehensive cloud native database management service. I'll drop a link to that in the chat window, so I hope you can join us if that interests you. I'm also going to drop a link to our survey that we're running with OCI customers. If you have a moment to share your opinions and your feedback, that's super uh, wonderful for us. We really appreciate your time and your experience in doing that. And our last two quick reminders, we encourage you to use that Q&A box down at the bottom of the window there for any questions throughout the presentation today. And we're also recording. So if you have colleagues you think might be interested that were unable to make it, I will drop links to the replay uh, for this as well. So you can send that on to them. All right, that is about enough from me. I am going to hand it over to Jeff and I'm gonna launch one more poll as I do, just to have our presenters get a little bit of an idea of your experience about ARM. So if you wanna go ahead and answer that second poll up there, I will hand it over to Jeff and uh, take it away. Thanks, Ken, I really appreciate it. And uh, welcome everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, as Ken mentioned, my name is Jeff, I'm part of the OCI Compute Product Management Team. And um, you know, during our time together today, we're gonna to be getting pretty deep in ARM Compute on OCI. Um, and, and a few things are, are, are gonna be on the list of what we plan to cover. Um, we're going to, first of all, really introduce what A1 uh, Ampere instances are all about. Um, we're going to take a look at some of the workloads, probably workloads common to what you uh, use today and how they can be applied and how they can use and take advantage of, of, of the A1 uh, instances. Um, we're also going to look at some demonstrations that show how you can both deploy quickly and run multi-architecture um, uh, solutions in your environment. And then finally, we've assembled a round table of some, some real technical experts and, and, and folks that really are excited to both talk uh, in a panel discussion about A1, but also answer your questions. So let's get started. Um, so we firmly believe that ARM is the future computing. Um, and, and today we wanna make sure we talk about how we make it possible for you to take full advantage uh, of ARM and the Ampere Ultra Processor, uh, as well as the rich ecosystem that has been developing over the last few years to really take advantage of this technology. Um, and, and so we want to dive into that day today and, and share how you can best take advantage of it. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is really take you back in time a little bit. Um, if you're old enough to remember some of these different architectures, um, extra credit available to you. Um, but as you look back in time, you know, back in the early 80s or in the 80s and, the, and, and into the 2000s, 2005, there were a lot of architectures available. Things like Spark, MIPS, and x86, all on the server side. And, and then we expanded to see things like other architectures like PowerPC, Itanium, and others. And then as you get into kind of the 2010 to 2016 frame, there was a lot of consolidation and all the way to the point where x86 was really kind of the dominant or, or, or singular architecture available to be able to run service side compute. And so one of the things that's interesting is if you look at over the last few years, 
you've seen a resurgence of some new architectures to take advantage of new challenges uh, and, and address new challenges and solve new kinds of problems. For instance, GPUs being brought into the fold for people building artificial intelligence and, and inferencing and all kinds of different uh, high compute uh, need uh, applications. And, and, and further to that point, over the last few years, we've seen a resurgence now only recently in terms of ARM. ARM is beginning to become a very rapidly adopted uh, uh, architecture for a few reasons, because it's efficiency, it's performance, um, and, because you, and, and because of that, you see it in many different places. You see it in smartphones, you see it in IoT devices, and now if you look closely, you see it in some of the world's most powerful supercomputing platforms, and now it's also something that on the server side in the cloud is something that you can rely on to run your uh, workloads more effectively. So today we're gonna to spend some time talking about the Ampere A1 compute for the modern cloud. And, and, and some really key points you have to keep in mind as we get into this is people are very excited about this because first of all, the predictable performance this architecture provides. By design and by single, single threaded core design, it allows you to do things that, that really aren't available with other architectures. At the same time, it delivers improved security by that design, um, by removing some of the core sharing and thread issues that you see common with other platforms. And finally, it's really hard to find a better price performance option available today. And we'll get into some of the performance metrics and some statistics to show you exactly how that applies to some of the common workloads you probably deal with on a regular basis. Um, in addition to some of these, these really powerful benefits, we offer uh, up to 160 cores on bare metal. We also offer flexible VM shapes so that you can choose the combination of cores and memory that you want to serve your purposes uh, on demand so that you get what you pay for and you only pay for what you need when you run this architecture. So with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to really turn it over to some of the technical experts and I'd like to pass it over to Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay, do you wanna, wanna take it from here and tell us more about the uh, Ampere Ultra uh, platform? Absolutely. Uh, Jeff, can you hear me? Sure can. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. Um, so uh, as Jeff talked about, uh, there are specific advantages to the Ampere Ultra uh, processor. And uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about workloads, and then we're going to uh, end with a little bit of a chat with Sean Warley from Ampere about it. But let's start with what it is, right? So it's an 80-core uh, uh, processor, which we offer in uh, a dual socket configuration that allows up to 160 cores um, uh, running uh, on basically a Neoverse N1 ARM V8 uh, architecture. So that look at that as kind of the highest density or the largest um, ARM shapes that you're going to get in the market, uh, in, in the cloud today. Uh, it also runs at a three gigahertz sort of maximum frequency and can run that consistently. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then it's got uh, a large cache um, and it's got built-in um, uh, design that especially is an advantage for compute intensive workloads like inferencing. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. Thanks. So, what do we mean by um, some of the advantages about the ultra processor, right? So we, we start with uh, understanding that unlike our other x86 offerings from AMD and Intel, the um, Ampere A1 uh, uh, uses a single thread per core. What that gives you is um, consistent performance, right? So you, you get uh, the, the three gigahertz frequency, it runs consistently. And, and, and I'll talk about also the fact that it scales also consistently. It avoids some of the hyper threading overhead that x86 uh, processors face today. So uh, you get that. The single thread per core also means that you're not uh, potentially sharing uh, a certain cache, uh, sections of the cache uh, with uh, other uh, threads on the same core. So that lowers vulnerability to, to side channel attacks, like uh, if folks have followed along with Spectre, Meltdown, some of those more speculative execution um, uh, concerns are sort of minimized with this kind of an architecture. So that sort of by design gets you better security. And then the other thing also is 
it sort of also the one thread per core sort of isolates your workloads. So you're less dependent on thread contention, if you will, at, at, at certain, um, for certain workloads. Uh, let's talk now about some of the specific workloads that we have and, and how that shows up uh, the advantages of the A1 Ampere show up. Jeff? So we, we want to first start with talking about uh, general purpose workloads. So here we are showing you um, Nginx. So uh, think of this as your classic web server uh, workloads. And what you see is that the Ampere A1 performs well. And when you factor in the price, the price performance provides a significant advantage. So if you have got sort of modern containerized workloads, especially that you can easily migrate over to Ampere A1, that now becomes uh, a way for you to sort of optimize your spend uh, and make your workloads run more efficiently on the cloud, right? This is something that in OCI we are constantly driving to, to always provide the, the best performance at sort of the lowest cost to the customer. And Ampere A1 really delivers on that uh, um, uh, goal in, as, as you can see in these charts. And uh, we'll have links to this uh, blogs and other information um, either uh, at the end of the slide or on the forum. So uh, you can drill into it a little bit more detail there. Uh, the, the next thing I wanna talk about is the benefit with uh, more CPU bound or CPU intensive workloads. An example of that is sort of media encoding or video encoding, right? And so again, what you see here in these three charts is a perfect encapsulation of Ampere A1, right? On the left, you see that the Ampere A1 sort of thread to thread uh, performs as well, if not better than X, the latest generation x86 processors, right? And then when you factor in price, again, you can see the advantage where sort of Ampere really shines. And then the last one is something I want to draw focus to. We talked a little bit about single uh, thread per core and how that provides a sort of consistent performance. And what you see here is this normalized chart. So this is not uh, uh, sort of a comparative performance between processors uh, in a raw sense. What this shows is that uh, if you have uh, eight threads available, that is eight cores on an A1 or four cores on x86, and you try to scale your workload from one all the way to eight threads, on the A1, as you can see, it's almost near linear scaling for CPU bound workloads like media encoding, certain HPC workloads, AI inferencing, those, uh, uh, encryption. So you can see it scale. Whereas with the x86 ones, you start to see it bend. And this is because of the hyper-threading contentions, the way the, the, uh, the, that design um, shows up, uh, especially in these kind of workloads. And so what I want to, the conclusion we want to kind of hammer home here is that especially on CPU bound workloads or compute intensive workloads, you're really getting what you pay for with the Ampere A1. Uh, and then another example of that is AI inferencing. So one of uh, the, the partners and vendors we're working with is OnSpec uh, that's got uh, a deep inference uh, uh, engine that uh, they have been working with us and Ampere on, and it's available on our marketplace. And again, you can see in terms of the AI inferencing workloads, how, especially when you factor in the uh, price, uh, Ampere A1 really provides great price performance. So um, that's that's the uh, 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 sort of a quick run through about key workloads, right? General purpose workloads like Nginx uh, and then more compute intensive uh, workloads like encoding and then uh, inferencing. Um, now uh, let's, let's uh, on that same way, let's try to drill in a little bit. I, I'd like to bring in Sean Barley, uh, uh, the Senior Solutions Director from Ampere Computing is also on the line. Hey, Sean, how are you doing? I'm great, Sanjay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, Excellent. So, so, uh, so I kind of did a very quick run through of this stuff. And what I'd like to do is have you sort of expand on this 
um, um, a little bit, starting with maybe you can talk about, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of kind of your design philosophy or how you went about designing the Ampere ultra processor that's used in the A1 instances. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having us here at Ampere um, with you guys today. And, uh, you know, I, I was listening to everything that you and Jeff said, and, and, and wow, you know, in a short amount of time, you guys have really come up to speed on our architecture, so I'm not sure why I'm needed, but, but I'll do my best for you. Um, so uh, let, I'm going to start at maybe a little bit, a little, uh, you know, lower level, you know, starting from core design, you know, one of the philosophies of, of building what we call a cloud native processor is to have essentially very, very um, crucial uh, power per core um, efficiency. That allows us to pack more cores into a processor uh, with our power budget. You know, every, every piece of silicon has a power budget. If we can keep the per core power down, we can pack more in. So that it's kind of a foundational piece of our philosophy. Uh, the next part of it is, is you have to be able to interconnect those cores, uh, you know, very, very efficiently and very at, at a high, with a high performance mesh. Uh, now that um, allows us to have, you know, very parallel workloads communicating uh, with each other and, and with the memory and the IO um, at very predictable rates. And so that high, uh, high frequency mesh, high bandwidth mesh on a monolithic die really helps us kind of keep performance in a really tight zone. And then you guys really touched on single threaded um, you know, cores, and this has been a design philosophy for us for quite some time. You know, with the cloud, you're really looking at um, you know, very, very dispersed uh, distributed software workloads that, that need to hit a lot of different cores uh, to get uh, a, a single result, if you will, or a, or a final product. And, and having each of those cores execute predictably, or each of those threads, if you will, um, you know, up until, uh, you know, very recently, as Jeff introduced with x86, you know, a thread and the core were different. With us, it's the same. And as you put a piece of work into that core, you're going to get it through that core at the same rate every time. And that's also because of our frequency, and you touched on it briefly. The frequency uh, characteristics and the way we run ultra processors is to run every core at that same high frequency. The only time we ever throttle anything is if we get into a thermal overload, and that's very, very rare. You almost have to have a power virus to do it. So, you know, all of those things combine to give you that very linear scale that you showed. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Uh, uh, I think you 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 went through uh, a bunch of stuff uh, and actually even answered one of my other questions I was going to ask you about single thread design. But let's transition now to a little bit about workloads. Let's talk about how the ultra processor lends itself to specific workloads. Uh, so we, 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 we touched upon sort of the, the, the strong performance, the density, uh, the consistent performance. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have positioned Ampere A1 really as a, a general purpose queue which addresses a range of different workloads. And uh, Sean, so help uh, maybe pick on a couple of these uh, ones that we have on the screen and maybe talk about how the uh, Ampere, as, as you were designing it and working with partners uh, and the ecosystem, um, how you thought about how the Ampere or how should customers think about how the Ampere A1 uh, is applicable to different workloads? Right, thank you. Yeah, so this is something that we thought a lot about. Um, you know, you see a number of the workload um, areas, what we call them domains uh, at, at Ampere, you know, kind of factor into this, but coming back to that cloud native processor design, you know, we've really thought about, you know, all of the major workloads that run in the cloud that are very distributed in nature, right? If they're firing off multiple processes, um, you know, if they, if they need uh, many threads or, or many elements uh, to to kind of return results. These are web apps. They're front both front end and back end. You know the key value stores uh, work really well with this type of a design. Um, you know anything that needs to um, you know fire off a lot of parallel processes is going to work really really well on our architecture. It is a general purpose architecture as you as you kind of uh, mentioned. Uh, so. Uh, you know, that kind of is the foundation of it, that scale out architecture. And one thing I didn't mention in the architectural philosophy part is the large L2 cache. We made a trade-off. We said, 
large L2 cache is a big deal. That's where you get the most memory right next to the cores, and it's the you know the kind of the lowest latency um, you know kind of capability there. So what we're finding is a lot of workloads that can be pipelined into these cores using that the value of that large L2 cache. Um, it can can really shine. So computationally intensive co um, computing, whether it's the media transcoding, and you showed some benchmarks there, or science, some some of these scientific computing applications that really scale out um, are looking really good. AI inference, you had some nice benchmarks there. Uh, you know anything that can be containerized and and you know kind of put through you know, these single threaded cores is going to look pretty good. And so, you know, we're still doing a lot of benchmarking in conjunction with you guys, and we welcome uh, many of the uh, the audience members uh, online to try out your free service and see if, if their workloads, uh, you know, will look the same. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Sean, for that. Uh, uh, as it turns out, we really did need you. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, now that we've talked about workloads, uh, let's take a look at uh, a couple of demos. Uh, I'd like to introduce Manish Kapoor from our OCI product management uh, and go-to-market team. Uh, Manish, take it away. Thanks, Sanjay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Thanks, Sanjay and Sean. Uh, I learned something new again, Sean, today. So it's always good to have you on the call. Uh, my name is Manish, and I am from the OCI product management team. I'm really excited about this new Ampere Avon Compute offering that we just uh, announced a couple of weeks back, as it opens up new opportunities and also provides additional choices to us in terms of the CPU architectures that are available to us. Uh, so I'll show you a very simple demo. Uh, this demo is basically uh, uh, created on the uh, using a reference architecture. Uh, so let's get started. And it is a recorded demo, so I'll just walk through it in the interest of uh, time. I recorded it because it does take about 10 minutes to do the uh, demo. So uh, we have a, Oracle has a, OCI has a reference architecture website where we have commonly used deployment patterns uh, shown there. And you can see the slide. Uh, the URL is docs.oracle.com slash solutions. If you have not seen them, I would encourage you to check them out. We have reference architectures for various uh, commonly used deployments out there. Today, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you how easy it is to run Java applications using Tomcat servers and an Oracle database backend. Uh, can you hit the play button? Yeah. Yeah, so on this reference architecture, you'll see on the right side, there's a reference architecture for deploying uh, Tomcat. And that's the one which we'll use uh, today to uh, uh, for the demo. Yeah, so this, uh, as it opens up. So as you can see, every reference architecture has got, uh, you know, uh, a layout of, of the architecture in terms of how we have deployed it and we follow the best practices. And these are vetted architectures, which you can quickly use to deploy your applications. So in this case, we are deploying two Apache Tomcat servers and backend is a, a, a autonomous database. We list all the considerations and then there's a deploy section there as uh, we see you see it on the screen and there's a magic deploy button there. If you click on that deploy button, it will directly take you to uh, your tenancy or you can, uh, there's also a GitHub link. If you click on that, you can get to the GitHub source code for this reference architecture where we show you how to build the reference architecture. The source code is there. You can run the uh, deployment uh, using either the deploy button on the GitHub page or on the docs page. So I'll use the docs page. Here I click on the deploy button as soon as I click on the deploy button, it takes me to the OCI login page. And if I have already logged in, which is the case here, it uh, starts, uh, you know, it takes me right into the console. We have several regions around the world for OCI. And here I pick up the London region for demo. So I first select a, uh, the, the region and then I accept the terms and conditions and just basically, you know, give it a name uh, for my stack uh, and then some description for the stack, move to the next step. And here I have some configuration variables that I can part use. I use my own compartment, specify the availability domain, uh, give the password uh, for my uh, autonomous database that I'm using in the backend. Uh, I can use the free tier database or not. In this case, I'm not using the free tier database. And then I have the load balancer in front of my uh, web servers. Uh, and then I submit my, you know, select a, a, a public key for my virtual machines, which are running the Tomcat server. I, submit that, 
and then I can choose the flex shape. We have flexible shapes for Ampere, even compute instances where you can select the amount of cores and amount of memory. So I just take one core and 10 GB of RAM, and then I have the ATP configuration, which is the autonomous database configuration, uh, where I specify, uh, you know, what I need to uh, use in terms of the display name, the database name, the number of cores, and then uh, things like that. And once I've specified that, I just, uh, you know, go to the next step and uh, look at my review, my configuration here, uh, the stack information, uh, the required configuration information, and, you know, the optional configuration. And then there's a, a new thing which we added in our deployment architectures is run, apply upon uh, creating the stack. So it automatically not only creates a stack for you, and it applies that stack, uh, stack for you. And these stacks are basically Terraform-based stacks. Uh, so they are Terraform scripts. The job is submitted, it's running. Uh, it will set up this uh, deployment, will set up two Tomcat servers, a Bastion host, and an autonomous database in the backend. And this takes about 10 mini minutes. So in the interest of time, I'll just you know uh, uh, cut some of the parts of the demo here and directly go to the last page here. As soon as it deploys, uh, you will be able to access your uh, reference architecture. Uh, so it will it will basically show uh, you, it will provide you with the IP address of the uh, Apache Tomcat servers and the URL that can, you can use to access the Apache Tomcat servers. And in this case, I have also deployed a sample uh, Java application on my Apache Tomcat server. So there you see it has deployed the architecture. Uh, and now at the end of this, in the logs you'll find the URL for uh, your uh, Apache Tomcat server. And then the second URL is for the Java app, uh, which has been deployed as part of my reference architecture. And of course, what you can do is here, I've used a sample app. In real world, what you would do is basically you would go to the GitHub uh, repository and you would, uh, you know, you can change the source code based on your needs. So you could deploy your own apps or you could deploy a vanilla uh, Tomcat server along with autonomous database or any other database. It could be a MySQL database. So we have given you the scripts for one set of configuration and you can use it for anything else. So here I go to my uh, to-do Java app uh, on my uh, newly deployed reference architecture, uh, hitting the URL. So there you go. So there's a sample to-do application. And to confirm that it works, I will add a to-do action item for me. I need to fix a lot of bugs today. So I'll just make a, a note for me to fix all the bugs. Uh, that I've uh, been pending on my plate for last week. So I create a to-do note and submit it. So what happens is this Java application is uh, talking, writing this data into the backend autonomous database. And this is just to confirm that the demo is working, uh, right? So I'll add that note. And you can see that uh, it, it has got added. Uh, so, so there it is. Uh, so this was a really simple, quick demo. The idea behind it was to show you how easy and it's similar experience that you'd have been accustomed to using x86 architecture or the Intel and AMD architectures. It's a similar architecture, similar look and feel. We have ensured that our compatibility in terms of user interface, you have a similar user interface. And here I'm showing you the instances that were created. You can see the two Tomcat servers that were created. Uh, and uh, there's a bastion server and then there's uh, autonomous database uh, uh, back, uh, um, back end for this architecture. So you can access all the information about the compute instances and the autonomous database uh, using the console. And it's exactly the same experience that you would get deploying any other compute option, whether it's uh, Intel, AMD or uh, Ampere compute, right? Uh, so uh, that, that, that was the quick demo here. Uh, I will, uh, you know, now, pass it on to uh, Avi. Uh, Avi joins us all the way from Australia uh, and he has recorded this demo for us because it's too late in the night for him. Uh, but you can see how quickly and easily he can build Docker images for the ARM architecture. And uh, okay, here, take it away, uh, Avi. I think you're not hearing the audio, Jeff. 
got an MD64, so an Epic E4 instance, which is going to run my Podman remote. Let's go enable now. Podman socket. It's just going to enable remote access to Podman. So if you take a look uh, at the status of Podman, there it's running. And now I'm going to do nothing else on that machine. I'm going to switch across to my uh, A1 instance compute, uh, and I'm going to start uh, a standard process of you know building a this. In this case, it's a Node.js app that I, I borrowed that I, I adjusted from GitHub uh, just to get some stats out. It's a, one of those standard sort of um, cloud native apps. It's a fairly straightforward Docker file. I'm going to use a pre-built Node.js image from GitHub Container Registry that we built. So it's one of our Oracle images, developer images for speed, um, just to get the build happening pretty quickly. Uh, copy the app in, run some uh, NPM steps, and then start the service. So this is a fairly straightforward um, you know, process using Podman. I'm going to um, force the format of the Docker format, so using the Docker image format as opposed to the OCI format. Uh, this gives us maximum um, compatibility. If I have time at the end, I'm actually going to run this on a Raspberry Pi locally on my, on my desk um, if I have time once this finishes, but we'll see how we go. Um, if you'll notice, I'm tagging it demo version 1.0 with a uh, suffix ARM64 V8. In the container world, the version or the AArch64, as we might know it in the kernel, is known as the platform Linux slash ARM64 slash V8 as the variant. So it's the V8 variant. Um, you, annoyingly, the use of that V8 is not consistent. <laughs> so there'll be some folks, sometimes we'll need to use the V8, sometimes we don't. Um, I've used it just because ARM64 and AMD64 are exactly the same length and look very similar on a screen. So the V8 just sort of adds that extra identifier in this case. Um, running the build, this is a live build, by the way, this is an uncached live build. This is how fast it will run. Um, so it takes about 20, 30 seconds for it to build my little desktop app, it tests it. So there you go, it's running its um, you know, uh, launch tests just to make sure that it's fine. And it has committed it. It's now saved that image out. So that's you know DNF updating, loading the image, committing the image, doing everything else. So let's you know, take it for a spin. Let's run that thing. Um, I'm just going to uh, start it up uh, on my standalone. Uh, and let's go across to a browser here. So Oracle Linux Cloud Developer, that one. And there's my demo dashboard. OK, so it's Oracle Linux Server 8.3 on Linux ARM, running our UEK uh, 6 update 2, which is our 5.4.17 kernel. It has four cores, this particular VM. It has one thread per core. It's using I don't know, 6 gigs out of 24 gigs of memory. I'm just going to work out why. Um, probably Podman, that's probably assigned six gigs for my one container, but it's up and running. And if I go and stop that, um, well, I've got to look at the logs, there's the logs. Um, it's a standard sort of um, app, but if I stop the app, um, the nice thing about this thing is it will go and <laughs> turn everything off. There it goes offline, so over in the corner. So it's it's live, it's interactive, it's, it's all the stuff is happening, which is pretty cool. Now I'll see where the fun happens. And this is something that I wish, um, I had learned about Podman way before because I, it's always the thing that's annoyed me. Podman has a remote control capability built in uh, to each client, and it works over SSH. So it's secure. <laughs> the, 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 the comms channel is a standard SSH channel, which then connects to a socket on the target server. So when I add a system connection, I can do it both. In this case, I'm doing it uh, as root in this uh, example because to be frank, it's simpler, and I didn't really want to spend a lot of time configuring a rootless access. Uh, but you can actually do it as rootless um, connections as well. So from your user, you can do Podman rootless to Podman rootless on a target server as well. Um, I will encourage. I, I, we've started building Oracle Linux 8.4, uh, and we've got some pre-builds internally for that. They've updated container tools inside the 8.4 uh, release. Uh, to the newer versions of Podman, Podman 3, which is in that version, is much better at um, rootless <laughs> access than Podman 2, which is the one I'm using here, the release version. So if you really want to play with uh, rootless containers, I suggest waiting until 8.4 comes out. It becomes really simple at that point. So I add a system connection. Um, essentially what I'm saying is I want 
the Podman on my, again, I'm on an AARC 64 machine, but I'm connecting to my AMD 64 machine. And all I need to do is add dash dash remote to each Podman command, and it works on the remote system. So you'll notice here, this remote system is the Linux AMD system. I do not have to copy anything else from this machine across to that AMD system. I just have to run Podman commands. So that exact same Podman build command that I ran earlier to run, uh, to build it on uh, Arc64, I can just run exactly the same command, add dash dash remote at the beginning, and away it goes. And now building exactly the same thing on the AMD machine. So again, this is going to be about 20, 30 seconds. Uh, the longest time it takes is to install the host name, because otherwise one of my node modules complains. Um, but it does the test, so there we go. Doing its uh, launch testing, finishes its build, and it's committed, and it's done. Uh, so now we're saved. Um, and if I look at the remote images, so I'm again using remote images, I see there is my AMD64 image I just created it 10 seconds ago. Um, now, we can run it. I, I am conscious of time, and I want to give us some QA time. So what I'm going to do is move on to the manifest. So I'm going to push the local copy of my ARM64 image to my uh, OCIR repo. I love pushing inside OCI. It is so fast. I'm going to push the remote image. Uh, and this is a really annoying bug in Podman 2. It doesn't show you any progress when it pushes a remote image. So it just stops. Uh, and you have to sort of wonder if it's going to happen. And it finishes, which is great. <laughs> but if we go across to OCIR um, and I refresh my um, registry, yeah, man. There we go. So I can see AMD64 and ARM64 in my ACE demo uh, repo. Um, I will show you these digests now, but they become important a little bit later because as we see the, the manifest list that gets created. How you build a multi platform image is through something called a manifest list. So with Podman, we create the manifest, give it a sort of a generic name, we add uh, actual images to that manifest list. I can do it and I can use a number of targets. I'm going to use a Docker image on a container registry, but you can use OCI images, you can use tarballs, you can use the local dam, and you can use <laughs> all sorts of sources to create the manifests. Um, I'm going to add the AMD64 version as well, also from the same OCI R repo. Um, and here's a fun trick. You can add images from other repos. You can add images from other registries. Um, that actually technically works. If you look <laughs> at what the manifest does and what it looks like, it's standard JSON um, inside the manifest list. And this is a Docker manifest list standard. So you see the media type is Docker distribution manifest list. There is also an OCI image indexed um, standard, which is the sort of the open container initiative version of the manifest list. They both pretty much do the same thing. Uh, I'm using the Docker one again for um, compatibilities. If I get a chance to run this on my RPI, but that's the manifest list. It, it essentially says for demo you know, colon one dot I actually have two options for you. If your OS is Linux and your ARM 64, pick this digest. If your OS is Linux and your architecture is AMD 64, pick this digest. And if you look, um, once we push that manifest and we push the manifest exactly like you would push a normal Docker image, we push it back up to OCR as well. Again, it all exists there. So it's essentially just writing that JSON to the registry. Um, I will refresh up here. Yeah, man. There we go. Load up, there's 1.0. And the layers, if you look at the two digests, I've got 469 and 519A. If I go over here, there's 519A on the AMD64 image. And here is 469 on the ARM64 image. So you can map the uh, which layer and uh, which manifest it points to which actual image on this uh, target. So let's run that image. This is a more familiar sort of command. I'm going to run a Podman container from an image. Notice I don't provide any platform uh, uh, selection. I don't provide any architecture selection. I don't even provide the suffix there. I'm just using now the manifest list we just published. And away it goes. I'm going to run exactly the same thing remotely because I can. <laughs> and there it goes. Uh, I'm going to just select that to copy it across to my. Raspberry Pi. There it goes. Let's go to our browser. 
that should have come back online. If I hit refresh, there we go. If I go across to our Linux Cloud Developer AMD64. There's my MD64 and Linux x86. Sweet. Now let's go to my local RPI. So Docker run ISP. That press and pause it. Go. My dash, let's go here. Level seven on. I'm just sitting on my desk in front of me now, blurring away, <laughs> is on my R so There you go. It's uh, all of those are currently running. They're um, all stored in that manifest list. Uh, the thing I like about uh, using Podman as opposed to using Docker is I get native builds on each of these things. If you imagine tying this to Jenkins or tying it to another CI CD platform, you trigger the arch and the platform specific builds on that architecture, and then you just combine them with the manifest list using a control node at the top. Uh, that's, that's, that's it from me. I will stop sharing. Let's get started. What I want to do just... Great stuff, Ali. Um, uh, thank you so much for this. Um, so um, now that we've walked through the demos, let's talk uh, about sort of getting started, right? So um, we have made it really easy for you to get started. Uh, in addition to obviously operating system images, there's an Oracle Linux developer image that you can deploy and get started with. Uh, as Manish referred to, there's reference architectures, tutorials, uh, and, and demos like Avi's that help you get to uh, um, uh, testing at scale and even get to real workloads. And then we have uh, working with vendors um, and partners, we are building out uh, a broad ecosystem that leverages the larger ARM ecosystem that you can use for your workloads. Next slide, Jeff. So um, uh, at the end of the, um, uh, in the forum, we'll po point you to these links uh, about tutorials um, in the developer portal, uh, so you can get started there. Next slide, Jeff. Uh, and then this is a small list of uh, the um, uh, software stack that's available for you to run on Ampere A1. Um, and, and I say small because there's a much larger uh, ecosystem with sets of libraries and tools that uh, are compatible with uh, ARM in general and Ampere A1 in specific. So uh, again, go to the developer portal or the Ampere Solutions portal, and uh, you can get a list to a much larger list of stuff. But this provides you a, a brief hint um, at what, what you can do to get started. Um, and uh, uh, Jeff talked about sort of the flexible VM and the pricing, but there's, there's a lot of ways to get started easily. Right, uh, Ampere A1 comes with the most generous free care with four cores and 24 gig of memory, right? So that's available uh, both if, if you sign up as a trial tenancy, but also on your existing uh, tenancies. So uh, you can make use of this today um, with, with the tutorials with, that we have. So that's something that we strongly encourage you to do is try it out in your tenancies. It's available uh, in um, all of our commercial regions. So um, uh, please do get started with that. Um, and then um, for, for people who have, who don't have a tenancy in the cloud, who just want to get started, uh, you can always sign up for our free tier uh, with $300 in, in credits uh, for 30 days, at which points it transitions and still gives you the always free uh, uh, services that we mentioned. Uh, and then finally, if you want to really scale up uh, for open source developers, research institutions, or other people who are trying to build something for the ARM ecosystem, this is uh, how Oracle really wants to contribute back into uh, the larger ARM ecosystem because we understand that this is sort of like a shared goal and something that we want to uh, help uh, the uh, 
all sort of the ARM players, if you will, not just uh, us on OCI. So the ARM accelerator, you can, uh, there's a, there'll be a link to uh, of the developer portal uh, where you can apply. And then based on your use case, we can give you a much larger amount of credits that are valid for a much longer period of time, uh, 12 months or even longer. Uh, and uh, that's it. Um, uh, you can see how OCI makes it uh, um, easy for you to get started. Uh, and the advantages uh, of the MPRE one platform. Um, uh, thanks and back to you, Jeff. Sanjay, thank you so much, man. We we covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time. So so thank you. Um, some great demos as well to see uh, what you can do with A one and how quickly you can get started. So. Hey, with that, um, what I'm really excited about is introducing our expert roundtable. So, um, uh, and while we do that, uh, we've got another poll here that uh, Kenneth was nice enough to, to, to put up for us. And this is a chance to maybe tell us a little bit more about what you think you might be able to apply A12 based on some of the things we've covered today. Um, so that will be interesting to see how that, that comes up. Um, but as we get into the round table, let's get started. So I wanna introduce the, the, the group here. Um, uh, Kenna mentioned them earlier today, but or early in the session, but I wanna introduce Matt Taylor, who's the SVP of sales and business development at Ampere and Sean, who you met earlier. Uh, who was uh, able to dive really deeply into design, which is awesome. Thank you, Sean. And, and uh, then we have Matt Leonard as well, who's the vice president of OCI Compute. Um, and, and finally, Sanjay, who you've met as well so far. So uh, as we introduce you guys and get started, I guess while we wait for some questions to come in, um, I guess, first of all, I, I, I think it would be really important. I, I wanted to, to, to position the first question for Matt Leonard. So, so Matt, you know, um, from an OCI perspective, can you can you tell us a little bit about how important um, ARM is and how, how important Ampere is in terms of our approach to really unlocking this new compute uh, capability? Hey, Jeff, can you hear me? I sure can, yeah, thanks. Great, all right, sorry, my, my video has been disabled by our administrator, so I guess you, you just get my standard image. <laughs> um, just in terms of uh, what, what does ARM mean for OCI? Uh, Really, uh, there's a couple of probably key points that I want to call out. Uh, the first is, is about choice, right? Like we want to give uh, the consumers of the OCI platform lots of choices when it comes to compute. And uh, with the expansion of microarchitectures that we've started to see over the past few years with GPU um, expanding from x86, we're starting to see customers that need compute that's tailored uh, to the type of workload that they're running. And so, you know, Sean and Sanjay did a really good job talking about the types of workloads that run really well on ARM. And so for, for us in OCI, that's about giving a consumer's choice. Um, second of all, uh, the, the, the big thing I want to call about, out is really about enabling developers to build on the OCI platform. And so as we brought A1 on board, it wasn't just about launching a compute platform, it was about launching a, a set of tools and an ecosystem that's going to help developers be successful building on the OCI platform using ARM. And so those are probably the big key call-outs that, that uh, I wanted to make on this one, Jeff. Thanks. No, great. Thanks, Matt. Makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, um, it, it is absolutely strategic and, and, and it offers really some great options for customers. And, and as I think about customers, you know, maybe the next question as we kind of move into some more coming in, um, I really wanted to pose, you know, to, to Matt Taylor. Um, so, you know, you spend a lot of time talking with customers out there that are familiar with your technology and looking for uses for your technology. Maybe would you be one to dive into some of the most common use cases uh, that you're seeing, Matt, and some of the, the value that people are getting from, from ARM and Ampere uh, uh, from a, a workloads perspective? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, kind of interesting. I was looking at the, the poll that just got sent out and uh, good news is it aligns pretty well with what we're seeing. Um, you know, it, it's still early days, so I'll, I'll say that, but you know, really where we're seeing kind of initial traction and some of the larger deployments are in, I'd say probably four major areas. So one that we actually didn't post there is a, a use case we call ARM native. So um, this is, uh, we also call it Android in the cloud. The idea is running Android based applications or basically um, you know, virtual machines in the cloud and streaming that to an endpoint device. Um, we've got a couple of partners, one that we've launched called Jenny Motion. There's a few others coming on OCI cloud that uh, provide actually this emulation layer that allows you as a developer to do basically native ARM development um, and also into a streaming of an application 
on the OCI cloud. So we think that's a really interesting one. We've got a couple of large customers that are already using that. That's definitely one. Um, I'd say the second one is really around kind of the web server, game server type uh, environment where we see you know, a combination of something like we just showed with you know, Apache Tomcat with a caching database uh, behind it, you know, like a Redis or uh, a, a NoSQL uh, sort of database behind it. Uh, that's the second one that we see. I'd say the third one that we probably see is really around uh, kind of dense container microservices type environments. You know, one of the big advantages we have is by having the most number of cores of any platform on the market and those being single threaded cores, you get a really scalable, predictable uh, containerized environment where you're not competing, you know, a lot of other cloud environments, you're competing with some other tenant on the same core for those resources. And with the OCI, OCPU construct, with an Ampere core that is single threaded, you really get that dedicated resource for every container you scale up. And so we're seeing that as one that's really um, got a lot of traction, a lot of interest from the market. Those are probably the big ones that we see right now. Um, I think the other one that you know Matt mentioned just quickly, I'll, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, is really around some of the developer um, environments. And what we really see is uh, you know things like um, CI/CD loops, you know, people that want to run, you know, re continuous regression, continuous integration. Um, you know, OCI has done a great job of bringing all the major tools to market. You know, Jenkins, GitLab, you know, et cetera. And uh, you know, that's one that we see a lot of people migrating to as, as a starting point, if nothing else. Fantastic, Matt. Thank you. No, great, great stuff. Really interesting to see some of the, just the breadth, right, of what people can can do, the, the, the flexibility available um, and the combination of affordability of that flexibility is fantastic, right? So um, great stuff. Thank you. So actually, we've got a question from the the, the, the audience uh, and, and Sanjay, th this is probably best for you. So, um, you know, somebody asked a little bit about uh, running Oracle applications on, on A1. Could, could you dive into kind of what's possible, kind of what, what, what the, the, the path ahead looks like there and, and what people should expect? Um, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I think this is a great question from Javid. Um, I, I think to start with, let's talk about what we have, right? So uh, uh, Oracle Linux as operating system, Java, GraalVM, uh, MySQL, all of these sort of are, are key um, uh, Oracle products that run on ARM, run on Ampere A1 today, right? And so that's something that people can start with. Um, and, and it it's a beginning of uh, uh, the announcements that are gonna come that reflect the work that Oracle's doing with Ampere to make A1 more accessible to customers. So on EBS and other Oracle apps, this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, there's a lot of interest from these teams to build on ARM and they are in the process of evaluating and qualifying uh, on the Ampere A1. So uh, look out for kind of more announcements on this and, and please do reach out to us either through the forum or directly um, to us uh, and tell us if there are particular apps that uh, you're more interested and we can uh, work with those teams in Oracle and OCI to make that uh, a reality sooner rather than later. Fantastic, thank you. Great, great question, great answer. Thanks, Sanjay. I think um, the only other question that brings up too, you know, as you think about, um, and you touched on it briefly, ecosystem uh, and some of the partnerships, right? And some of the things that we're doing beyond that and, and Matt, you as well, right? For some of the partnerships. Sanjay, would you be willing to dive into just kind of like how important those partnerships really are and, and kind of, you know, some of the things we're looking to continue to do to advocate and, and I'd offer, you know, anybody that wants to, to add to that, you know, because because a big piece of this is the ecosystem, right? The big piece of this are the partnerships that help people, uh, help customers both get started faster, be able to build faster and leverage work that's out there that are tied to the partners or ecosystems as well. Um, anything you think that's worth mentioning yep. beyond that? Yep. So I, I think you we, we've talked a lot about it and we have spent a lot of time on this, which kind of shows the importance of the ecosystem uh, uh, on this. 
One thing I want to mention that we haven't touched upon, uh, uh, Matt, Matt did a really good job, hi, uh, Taylor did a good job highlighting the CICD work that we're doing and how that's going to help. But one of the things that we're excited about is opening up additional kind of workloads in the cloud, right? And one of those is mobile apps and our native. So we have partnered with Jenny Motion, um, uh, uh, so working with Ampere and Jenny Motion, and what uh, that allows you to do is allows you to start to do Android development at scale in the cloud. And we think that's going to be a game changer for a lot of people from everything from like social media, app development, uh, and, and, and potentially even uh, uh, gaming and other scenarios where uh, where if, if rather than trying to develop on a bunch of devices or emulate it on, on your own hardware, you can just spin up a bare metal or VM, launch a bunch of uh, Android instances uh, or Android uh, sort of uh, um, operating system or, or devices, emulated devices using Jenny Mobile, and then uh, and then run that at scale. And, and, and that's really going to fundamentally start to change things for a lot of people. Fantastic. No, thanks, Sanjay. Really, really, really good. Uh good insight into that um, and, uh, and the importance of the ecosystem and what people will be able to do moving forward. Okay. Well, with that, we're, you know, we've covered a ton of ground. Wow. I can't believe it's already been an hour. I um, want to thank, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Roundtable, for being a part of this. Um, you guys bring so much dimensionality to this really exciting new direction that we're taking in terms of, of, of compute and what you can do in the cloud. Uh, so thank you all for, for participating in that today. And we want to thank everybody for some great questions as well. Uh, we've been able to address some of them. Again, as Sanjay said, if you have more technical questions, I'm sure there are people's heads that are sort of you know, kind of spinning a little bit after seeing some of the demos and what's possible. Um, you know, definitely use the, the the forums as a place to do that, and 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 that's really a good bridge into some of the resources here that are available to you uh, uh, to uh, take advantage of to be able to ask those questions. Now, now, first off, if you want to get more into the, what A one's all about, please visit the site and and how ARM is really unique and different and why, why it's so advantageous to, to consider for some of these applications. Um, again, you can learn about the different programs. The forum here is the, the second to last bullet. You know, please use that. I mean, it's this community is your community. It's about what you wanna do. And, and, and many of us are very active looking at those questions and happy to dive in and answer those as you dive into it uh, further. Um, and then uh, further, if you wanna look more into the, the overall infrastructure platform community, there's a link there as well. So. With that, I really want to thank, you know, our, our presenters. Thank you guys, uh, you know, Matt and, and Sean from Ampere. You guys are fantastic partners and we're so, so grateful for you guys being able to participate today. So thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, Sanjay, Manish and, and Avi and, and, and Matt Leonard as well. Thank you for being a part of this. And Kenna, thanks for helping us put on a great, great uh, presentation. And we look forward to doing more of these in the future. Uh, but with that, um, I'd like to sign off and thank everyone for attending. And uh, we hope you'll uh, be able to take advantage of some of the things you've learned today and begin to deploy uh, A1 instances uh, in your environments. So thank you very much for attending.